Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I hope everybody can see the screen well and hear me well. If it's not the case, just let me know. Uh, thanks a lot to the organizers uh, for having me. Um, it's nice to be able to talk to an algebraic geometry audience uh, from time to time. Um, and I want to echo what Livia was saying. Uh, please do interrupt at any time. Um, one of the things about this talk is that it's bridging between uh, topology, in particular contact and symplectic topology, and algebraic geometry. So there might be some things that are not familiar, but I would like for them to be familiar uh, to you. So definitely just stop and say, I'd like more emphasis here. Can you give an example? Can you give details? The other way around also applies. If you feel it's too elementary, just complain and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make it less comprehensible. Okay, so the talk today comes out of a, a series of uh, thinking and work that we've been doing for the last year. Uh, the preprints uh, are listed here. They started with this one, and, and today I'm mostly going to be focusing on this one. The message of this is most of the work is on the archive, and the only piece of work that's not on the archive, it's this little upcoming piece in here, um, hopefully should be on the archive in the next few weeks. And so mostly it's going to be work with Eugene Gorski, Misha Gorski, and Jose Simental. Jose is around, so you can ask him questions too. Okay, so let's let's start. And the way that I've decided to structure the talk is by first telling you a bit about topology. So that's that's where I started. And despite the fact that most of the talk will be about affine varieties and algebraic varieties, um, my motivation and the way that I thought about these things really came from topology. So let me just in a couple of slides tell you uh, what the background is. And the background is the following. You have space R3, and hopefully we're all okay with R3. That's just three space. And we're all okay with what a knot in R3 is. So a knot is just an embedded circle, and there will be you know, very funky knots, something like that. So that's like a trefoil knot, things that are just knotted in space. So that's a circle embedded there. Now you can do knot theory, which is the study of these embeddings up to isotopy up to a smooth deformations of those embeddings. Um, but you can do something slightly finer than that, which is the study of Legendrian knots. So if you know what a knot is, a Legendrian knot is not far from it. All you need to do is instead of considering R3 just as a space, what you do is you put in each point of R3 a two-plane field. So you see here I've drawn for you R3, there's three coordinate axes, Z, Y, and X. But then at every point, there's an additional information I'm drawing here of a two plane. Okay, why we end up considering this two plane, that's maybe a question for another day. But once you end up considering this two plane, you can say, okay, how do I do knot theory knowing the information of this two plane field? This two plane field, by the way, is called a context structure. And the idea is I could just draw random knots in here flying around, or I could ask them to interact in a certain way with the contact structure, with the two-plane field. And there's mostly two things that you can ask. You could ask for your knot to always be transverse to this, to this two-plane field. So the circle is such that the tangent vector at every point is not contained in the two-plane field. That's called a transverse knot, and that's not going to feature. It's something that's studied in contact topology, but we're not going to care about it. What we're going to care is the opposite situation, which is if you think of this green line that you're seeing here, this is a circle, so that's something embedded in R3, such that the tangent space at each point is contained in this two-plane field. And these knots, knots that satisfy these tangency conditions, so I've drawn one here on the right, if you look at the tangent space that is contained in the two-plane field, those knots are called Legendrian. So the punchline is, if you are okay with what a knot is, and you probably are because you tie your shoes every day, then you might be okay with a Legendrian knot, which is just a knot in R3, except that you know that in addition, at each point, that knot is tangent to the two-plane field. So every time that I say now a Legendrian knot, you can just think about that. Oh, it's a knot in R3 with this tangency condition. Okay, what do you do when you have a Legendrian knot? So this is a way to study them that will lead to some interesting algebraic geometry. And the idea is the following, is you have this knot that you've considered, 
and you draw it in S3. So this is a 4D picture. It, it cannot be faithful, but the boundary of this ball is S3, and the inside of this ball is D4. So that's a four ball, and there is S3 in the boundary. And the knot lies at the boundary. So here I've drawn a knot and the boundary. And one thing that you can do from the smooth topology perspective is to ask about surfaces. This is a surface here that live in R4 and bound the knot. This always exists smoothly. For instance, you can take a cipher surface of the knot in S3 and push it inside of D4. And it is in general interesting to us think about those surfaces. What is the minimal genus? Can there be differently knotted inside of D4 and whatnot? Now, if you ask smooth questions about smooth knots, you don't arrive at algebraic geometry. The space of smooth knots, the space of surfaces that have a boundary at that knot, all those spaces are topological spaces, but none of them gets endowed with the structure of an algebraic manifold or of an affine or projective variety. Uh, so, so, you know, let's throw smooth topology out of the window because we're not going to get anything out of there. But if you rigidify the problem and ask for the knot to be Legendrian, so you take a Legendrian at the boundary of our S3, and then you ask for the surface not just to be a plain old smooth surface, but something that's called a Lagrangian surface. So you care about Lagrangian surfaces in D4, which bound that knot at the boundary. Now, um, if you're not OK with the Lagrangian surface, please just let me know. But one thing that you can think about is that in D4, you can put complex coordinates, say C2, ZW, and then you have the standard DZ, DZ bar form, and then DW, DW bar. And then all you want for a Lagrangian is that this guy, when you restrict it to this Lagrangian L, vanishes. So this is somewhat related to the notion of a totally real submanifold. And if you've seen what a Lagrangian is, it's just you have a symplectic form, which is what I wrote in here, and it restricts to zero in L. Being Lagrangian is strictly rigid. It's something that goes beyond just being a smooth surface. Not every smooth surface can be made Lagrangian. And if two smooth surfaces are isotopic as smooth surfaces, they might not be isotopic as Lagrangians. And so here I've recorded four salient facts that distinguish the standard smooth topology with symplectic topology. What makes symplectic topology special? What makes it more rigid than standard smooth topology? The first thing is a Legendrian knot might or might not have a Lagrangian filling. That's not true in the smooth category. In the smooth category, every knot bounds a certain surface. So in symplectic, already the existence of such Lagrangians is non-trivial. Second, if the filling does exist, and this is this point in here, its topology is very constrained. In fact, the genus of the surface, the number of holes that this guy has in here, is determined by the knot at the boundary. This is not true smoothly, and here's the proof. I can take the surface and put another genus in here. This thing that I can do by drawing, and hence smoothly, cannot be done in the Lagrangian setting. So again, the knot knows a lot about these Lagrangian feelings. An extreme instance of that is this third salient fact, which says that if you actually have the unknot, so if you just had a knot which is unknotted at the boundary, then you can find a Lagrangian filling which is just a disk, run of the mill disk, but actually that is the only one. And this is not true smoothly because there's an, a ton of smooth two spheres interestingly knotted in, in R4. Um, and the last thing, and that's where things get a bit more algebraic, those Lagrangian fillings are the main geometric objects of very interesting categories that appear in homological mirror symmetry. And here I cited the Rapp-Fukai category of C2 with a boundary at lambda, and also the category of sheaves. And the idea is that this category is exactly modeling that. It's modeling Lagrangian surface in R4 that have an asymptotic fixed condition in lambda. And uh, this lambda should be seen, in case you're familiar with Landau-Ginzburg models, this lambda should be seen as the geometric way of describing a Landau-Ginzburg model. If you have a Landau-Ginzburg model, so that's a W, say from C2 to C, and you take its fiber, the Lagrangian skeleton of its Weinstein fiber would be an example of such a lambda. Uh, but, but these are even more general. So they allow for more flexible 
LG models that I would not really know how to give you a formula for the W, but I know how to give you a nod. So that's that's still okay in order to define this rap Fukaya category stopped at lambda, which plays the role of um, the Fukaya Seidel category in a more general manner. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to tell you about topology. From now on, the talk is going to be entirely about uh, algebra, uh, but I want to explain how that transition happens. And the transition happens uh, by considering the model I of Lagrangian fillings. So um, in general, when you have a set of objects, whatever that is, say projective varieties or curves, when you consider the modelized space, that modelized space itself has the structure of a projective variety. Well, maybe it's a stack, but overall, if I study the modelized space of potatoes, I would expect that model I to be a potato or you know some kind of tuber. Now, the interesting thing about homological mirror symmetry, very sketchily explained, is that when you consider the model I space of potatoes, the thing turns out to be like a strawberry. And this is what's happening here. I'm going to consider the model I space of Lagrangian fillings, which is an object in symplectic topology. And that model I space will not be a Lagrangian. It will not be symplectic. It will not be anything related to symplectic topology. Rather, that model I space will be an algebraic variety. And that's kind of one of the tenets of homological mirror symmetry, which is considering certain model I on the A side, on the symplectic side, gets you to the B side, which would be, say, coherent sheaves. Um, so that's an instance of that. I'm, I'm starting in this A side, and then uh, we're going to end up with algebraic geometry thanks to this principle. Just so you have a quick sense of what this model I of Lagrangian fillings is, it's the following, is for every Legendrian lambda, we have a way to define a Legendrian isotopy invariant. That way is through floor theory, which I'm not going to explain in detail, but it's some kind of holomorphic disks. If you know open strings, so that's of witten invariant is closed string, then you have open of witten invariant, and then you have open of witten invariant where the boundary itself also has a, 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 an asymptotic boundary. So it's, it's a place where the boundary itself has a boundary. Um, and that boundary of the boundary is the Legendrian. So by counting some of witten invariants in this open setting together, you end up not with numbers, but with an algebraic structure of a Legendrian contact DGA. So this is a DG algebra associated to this Legendrian knot. So if you think in an algebraic mentality, the punchline of this slide is to say, oh, he's talked about some Legendrian knot, some notion of Legendrian knot. What algebraic invariant do I associate to it? The answer is a DG algebra. If you really like categories, then you can just consider modules over that DG algebra. And that's actually what's modeling the Fukaya categories associated to the manifolds obtained from that lambda. So that DG algebra is at the core of computing any Fukaya categories in the sense that, you know, what does computing a category mean? Maybe it means expressing it as modules over an algebra that you like. Uh, and that algebra would be this DGA in this case. Once you have the DGA, the precise way of defining the model I of Lagrangian fillings is through this notion of augmentations. So what you do is you take the functor of points perspective and you think about maps from your DGA A to some ground ring, which you can take to be the group ring of the homology of the Lagrangian. Uh, but again, the point is you just take, you know, quote, quote, spec of the DGA, certain maps from A somewhere else, and that's often called the augmentation variety. And any Lagrangian filling gives you a point there. It gives you such a map. Um, but in general, that model, I will have some like compactifying boundaries. Um, the right-hand side, I'm going to somewhat go over it quickly. It's just saying that there's two easy facts about this DGA, which is if your Legendrian knot is expressed as some positive braid, then we have a formula in terms of matrices that explains how to compute this DGA. And the second thing is, if you take a crossing in the DGA and you open it, that's creating another knot, there's maps induced between them. So that gives you some flexibility. If I have some positive braid word to just open a crossing, create another braid word, and then I have maps between these DGAs. So I have maps between the augmentation varieties. So I have maps between these modelized spaces of Lagrangian fillings. Okay, uh, so 
that's the end of symplectic topology. You can now refresh your minds and forget everything if you didn't like this beginning, or you can take that as, oh, okay, that's the background, that's the black box for whatever is going to happen next. Like, how did he know to do that or this? Well, I knew because I knew all this symplectic topology in applications to what we're going to do. I'm going to stop now. Are there any questions uh, regarding what I've said thus far? You can also say there are no questions because I see none of you and I have no idea whether things make sense thus far. I don't think there's any questions. OK, excellent. Let's focus on more affine algebraic varieties. OK, so having made that little introduction, let's now focus on the main ingredient for today, which is braid varieties. And there's going to be two discussions on braid varieties. The first one here, where I'm going to present braid varieties in their simplest form. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to discuss an enhancement or another way to think about them, which will allow us for some more flexibility. Here's a precise algebraic definition of a set of algebraic varieties that are actually pretty useful to study topology and their bridge to algebraic geometry. What you do is the following is you fix the number i between 1 and n. That's a subindex here. And then you consider this matrix. So this is the matrix we find to be b i z. z is a variable. And the matrix is going to be the identity everywhere. So this is the identity here, the identity here. And then it has this box. And the box is 0, 1, 1, z. That matrix is in GLN. And it has coefficients. Well, in this case, it's pretty simple, a polynomial in Z. OK, take that matrix. That's a simple definition. And now you make the following admittedly kind of odd definition, which is the following is you start with a braid word. So you can think of the Arden generators of the braid groups, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, and then you combine them in a word like sigma one squared times sigma two times sigma three squared times sigma two times sigma one to the fourth. And then you associate to that positive braid word the following variety. For each crossing, so the crossings here are sigma 1, sigma 2, so sigma i1, sigma il, where l is the length of beta, you do the following. For each of the crossings, you draw a matrix associated to that crossing. And the i in the matrix here is exactly the i in the crossing that you have. So you have a first crossing, you consider the first matrix. You have a second crossing, the second matrix. You have the last crossing, you consider the last matrix. You take all those matrices and you multiply them. And the way that you do that is each of the matrices that you introduce have a different variable. So the first crossing gets a variable Z1, the second crossing a variable Z2, the last crossing another variable Z something. And the affine variety that you want to consider is the set of all those variables Z1 through ZL such that the product of these matrices, this is the product in here, Maybe after you've moved the last column to the beginning, so times this Coxeter element sort of in matrix form, but you can kind of ignore that one. You want that to be upper triangular. Now, this is an algebraic condition, is a bunch of matrices being upper triangular. So that asks you for a bunch of zeros. You can discuss uh, whether you want this diagonal in the upper triangular matrix to be fixed or not. Um, in general, we're not asking it to be fixed. Uh, but there's going to be a torus action that allows us to fix it. Um, but this is what we call the braid variety. Up to now, I've done nothing. I've just associated a braid. Uh, sorry, I've associated an affine variety to a braid. But this affine variety a priori has no merit. You know, a monkey can associate something to a braid. But, but the, the way of associating that might be very heavily dependent on the choice of braid word and not its class in the braid group. One property which is very important of this braid variety is that it actually does not depend on the braid word. So I'm going to be commenting this in a second. So this definition is not just out of nowhere. It has this property that it makes sense to call it a braid variety because it will be independent of certain choices we've made. Um, so here's an example that starts to illustrate why these varieties might be interesting. Take uh, the trefoil. So this is an example that 
if you think about the Legendrian link behind, the Legendrian link behind is the trefoil. Take the trefoil knot, that's sigma one cube, and then you have to multiply it by delta, so that's sigma one to the fourth. What is it? Well, you write down the equations and you end up having this hypersurface. You end up having the hypersurface cut out in C4 given by this equation over here. Now, if you've never seen this equation, that's fine, but this equation is very familiar uh, to some people. Euler in particular studied this kind of equations through his Euler continuance. And you can write that equation, the point in C4 that satisfy that, that's a complex hypersurface. You can write it as this complement. So that's the complement in C3 of the points that satisfy Z1 plus Z3 plus Z1, Z2, Z3 equals zero. So this guy at the end of the day is just made out of surfaces which are of this form, Z1 plus Z3 plus Z1, Z2, Z3 equals alpha. Uh, maybe it's a good time to ask the audience, have you ever seen anything like this equation? Well, okay, maybe yes, and you're being shy, or maybe no, uh, but this equation itself is actually a friend. Uh, it does appear in a variety of contexts, and maybe one example which is pretty specific is, this is actually one A2 cluster variety, if you like cluster algebras, and from an algebraic geometric viewpoint, what it is, is you take the toric manifold associated to the pentagon, which is a Delpezzo 5 surface, and then you remove a smoothing of the anti-canonical divisor. So you take the toric divisor, which consists of the five faces of the pentagon, you smooth it out, taking each normal crossing and smoothing it out, and then you look at the complement of that anti-canonical divisor, and that's exactly this affine variety. Uh, it is also the affine variety that you obtain if you consider the four ball, the trefoil on the boundary, and you attached a handle among the trefoil. Um, so that's that's part of the reason why the trefoil is behind. But the point is, this braid variety that we get has a series of interesting properties. On the one hand, it comes as the complement in a certain toric diagram. On the other hand, it has a cluster structure. And on the other hand, it also has a relation to certain knots, in this case, the trefoil. Okay. So here's four instances, uh, and you can stop me in each one of them and say, oh, I, I like these words. Can you expand on that? But here are four instances uh, that explain a bit what this braid variety is doing for you. So what is this braid variety doing? As I said, the right answer really is, it's the modelized space of augmentations of a certain DGA for a Legendrian knot. That's the right answer. But if you can phrase this in another way, you also gain perspectives that are useful. One thing that this variety is doing is parametrizing the following paths. This variety is studying paths that say start on this strand, so that's the third strand, and end up maybe in this third strand. So what if I just cared about combinatorics and I had a dispositive braid in here and I ask how many paths are there from this third strand to this third strand? So they start here and they end here. Well, there's many paths following the strands or none, depending how you count. But what you do is you allow yourself the following thing. When you have a positive crossing, you allow yourself to come from the left of that crossing and then bounce on the crossing and keep going up. So for instance, an allowable way to get from point A to point B is the following, is you start here, you then bounce at Z1, and then you don't bounce anywhere else, and you end up in here. That path is something that is allowed, and if you ask how many paths are there such that you can possibly bounce at the crossings this way, the answer is exactly given by the entries of that product of matrices. So that product of matrices that we considered in the definition of the braid variety can be understood as counting, its entries are counting number of paths from point A to point B that bounce at crossings. And every time that you bounce at crossings, that is a contribution of this Z in here. So if you think of this little box, what this little box is saying mostly is when I'm coming up from Z1, I can either go straight down, that's this first column, and then I can bounce at Z1, and that's this one Z1 option. So from a combinatorial perspective, it's counting these kind of paths. 
So if you like combinatorics, that might be an object of interest to you. From a perspective of flag manifolds, what this is doing mostly is the following, is you can think about a flag here on the left of your braid, and just think about the vector spaces 0, C, C square, and C cube, and then think of each of the strands as being an injective map. 0 injects into C, C injects into C2, C2 injects into C3, so that guy in here is a complete flag in FL3. So remember, that's let's just take GLN. That's just GLN mod um, upper triangular matrices, the Borel. So you have a flag on the left. And then what you can do is start moving the flag on the right to the right. And every time that you cross a crossing, so this is a crossing in here, every time that you pass it, you create a new flag. And what you're going to ask is that this new flag which also has zero, C, C square, and C cube, is exactly the same as before everywhere, except where the crossing has happened. So the crossings of the braid, you think of them as telling you, oh, I need to change the flag exactly at that point. If you ask now about the model I of flags that satisfies the conditions given by the braid, so here I would have one flag, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, so what is the model space of seven flags in C3, which have this transversality condition? So these two flags differ in the second space, these two flags differ in the first space, and so on. That gives you an interesting model space. It's a way of thinking about a bot Samuelson variety, but an open strata within. And these open bot Samuelson varieties are extremely close to this braid variety. So you can think of this braid variety as parameterizing these flags. Um, I'm going to now move on, but so you have some sense, um, these braid varieties are also doing something interesting from the perspective of cluster algebras. For me, uh, Pablo Pavliansky, um, who's the S? I forgot. Maybe Schustin, Schustin and Thurston. Anyway, a group of cluster algebra people uh, did associate to every singularity, to every plane curve isolated singularity, a cluster algebra. They did that through divides and the compost diagrams and by part of graphs. But you could ask, okay, what is this cluster algebra really? The answer is actually given by these braid varieties, or one answer. One answer is those braid varieties, in the case that the braid is of the form beta delta, are going to admit a cluster structure. And that cluster structure, when applied to the link of a singularity, is exactly the, the structure that they algebraically discovered. Uh, so that's a way of geometrizing their construction. And finally, to say uh, those braid varieties are interesting as spaces. I usually care about them as a fine varieties or their projective compactifications. But you can just, you know, make your life easier and just ask about their cohomology and maybe a weight filtration in their cohomology. And that actually gets you some interesting invariants. Uh, there's some recent work by Galashin and Lam computing some of these cohomologies. And you can also read the Humphrey polynomial of the knot associated to the underlying braid through these cohomological computations. So, you know, you're gaining some information at the topological level just by considering the cohomology of these affine varieties. Okay, so that maybe gives you a sense of the different places where these brave varieties appear and why they might be interesting to study. Um, any questions at this point? Sorry. Oh, any questions at this point? Okay. Seem so. Okay, well, you know, silence will fall and a question will be asked. So at some point, somebody will ask a question. Okay, so what's one thing that you can do about these brave varieties? Well, one thing that you can think about is to say, well, okay, there's a certain class of varieties. What, what properties do they have? And once I have enough properties about them, like I study them in the abstract, once I have enough properties about them, then I can go out in the world and apply it to places. Like maybe I want to show a certain conjecture, I want to solve a certain problem about a certain variety being of a certain type, having a certain structure. If I can find a braid that makes that variety a, um, a braid variety, then I just use the standard machinery of braid varieties that we're developing here in order to say something about that. And that's mostly what's going to happen. So at the beginning here, I'm just going to tell you the basic properties of braid varieties. Those are purely studying those varieties by themselves. And then in the last 10, 15 minutes, I'll explain an application of those properties into the world of Grismanians, in particular positroid varieties. So let me tell you some general properties about this. 
and I usually like to think about geometry in two terms. There's the absolute geometry, that is, you care about the potato itself, in this case, the brain variety, and then there's relative geometry, which is you care about the morphisms between the potatoes. And of course, you know, out back in the day, Grattan especially emphasized the importance of thinking about relative geometries. So we not only care about the properties of one braid variety, but the way that different braid varieties map between themselves. And that problem was solved, uh, I don't know, I don't know, Jose, like five months ago. Anyway, we posted the preprint that explains uh, some properties in both cases. The first thing is if you have a braid variety, that braid variety does not depend on the choice of braid word up to Rademeister three moves and conjugations. So if you are in the positive braid monoid and you see something like sigma one, sigma two, sigma one, and you change it by a sigma two, sigma one, sigma two, that braid variety stays the same as an affine variety. And the proof of that is relatively simple. You can check this in this example. It all boils down to the fact that there's this identity between matrices BI, BI plus one and BI, and matrices BI plus one, BI, and BI plus one. So again, why did I consider that particular kind of equations defining my affine variety? Well, one reason is this one. It satisfies this invariance, so I can really talk about the braid variety associated to the braid in the positive monoid, not just the braid word. Okay, more nice things about these varieties. If you take your beta to be of the form beta times delta, and that's something that you know you can just, if you just have a beta, just say, okay, I'm just gonna add the delta. Then your braid varieties become really like wealthy in structure. So first of all, the variety itself is a smooth variety. Second of all, it admits a torus action, which happens to be free. That torus action, again, intuitively is about asking that the upper triangular condition has also some fixed points, has some fixed values in the diagonal. So you could ask for it to be like unipotent, and that would be a certain slice in some cases. But in general, you just know that there's a free T action. And then that quotient, once you killed the ambiguity coming from the diagonal, actually not only is smooth, but now it comes with two very important geometric structures. First of all, it is an holomorphic symplectic manifold. So the torus is such that the dimension becomes even, which might not have been to begin with. And the second property is following work um, from symplectic geometry in the study of augmentation varieties, mostly Gao, Sheng, Weng. You can also deduce that those varieties admit cluster structures and the way to compute cluster seeds and cluster variables there is explained in our paper um, in the well in, in the case of two stranded braids and there's sort of an heuristic of how it should work in the case of three stranded and more um, so again if you ever cared about like a fine smooth manifolds which might be cluster varieties this is a large source of objects that are allomorphic symplectic and beyond their, their cluster a varieties uh, so you can think of them if you wish as like log Calabi Yao things. So you have um, you know, projective Calabi Yao manifold and then you take the anti-canonical out. The thing that remains is often of this sort. Okay, so that tells you something about one particular Bray variety. If I have one Bray variety, I know it's smooth. I know it's allomorphic symplectic. It has this cluster structure. But now what about morphisms between them? So that's the second part in here. The second part tells you, and I'm not going to go into super detail here, is that there is actually a way to study them with the main move being that every time that I see two crossings consecutive, so if in my braid I see these, I can change my braid by changing these two crossings by one crossing. Um, this is called the Neil Hecke move, or at least M Misha likes to call it the Neil Hecke move. And that produces a new braid. And the point is, if you do this move, you get a map, a morphism of algebraic varieties this way, from the braid variety associated to the right to the brave variety associated to the left. And in fact, the theorem is a bit stronger, is there's an entire diagrammatic calculus, I call it the calculus of weaves, um, that allows you to compute morphisms in this category of brave varieties where morphisms are correspondences in general through just diagrams. And uh, I'm not gonna go into the exact calculus for that. You're welcome to look at the archive preparing for some pictures, but the punchline out of that calculus is that by studying morphisms from simple braid varieties into more complicated ones, you end up proving that these varieties have 
very nice stratifications. So not only are these varieties cluster, which means it has this nice tori, open tori, like kind of covering most of it, but you can now look at the complement of those tori. You can even look at, at what's often called the deep points in the cluster variety. And there's a way to diagrammatically draw that. And I like that because if you think about ways to express cluster charts, or if you're in a toric manifold, ways to express like the main torus, there's usually like you know the combinatorics of toric polytopes, and then there's wall crossing if you're doing clusters, scattering diagrams, or maybe you want to do plavic graphs if you're doing combinatorics. But usually that only gets you the big open torus. It never kind of tells you how to compute things in the lower stratum. And this diagrammatic calculus does that for you. So uh, I don't know. I, I like it because of that. It kind of goes beyond and it allows you to access, for instance, diagrammatically infinitely many clusters at once, which, which is kind of nice. Uh, and we've used it. I've used this in topology a lot to solve some problems. OK, so that's the absolute geometry. And now I'm going to move to applications. Before I go to the applications, um, any questions? There are no questions in the chat. OK, so. yeah, thanks, Livia. OK, so what has happened so far? So far, uh, I've introduced for you a class of affine varieties called brave varieties, and then we've seen some properties of them. Um, we've also seen some motivation or different instances where these varieties would appear, parameterizing flags, parameterizing paths, caring about cluster structures, and so on. But once we have that theory of the braid varieties and their properties, now we can start to ask, where do these braid varieties appear? Because, OK, you have this class, but how useful is it in the world? Like if I am studying something as basic as a Grismanian here, or as basic as a certain projective surface, like do I have a braid variety somewhere lurking in there? And the answer is, I think, more surprisingly than not, yes. Uh, overall, the question that's sort of to be asked is, whenever I see a problem in algebra geometry, I'm always asking myself, is there a Legendrian braid behind? Is there a Legendrian knot underlying this? Can I realize this space as a model I of something? And this might sound crazy, but there's some interesting statements out there about how, in a way, any category, for instance, any quiver category, can actually be realized as a Fukai category. So it's not unreasonable to think that in many cases, there's going to be some symplectic object that when you study its model I, the answer is exactly the variety that you're interested in. And once you've realized your variety of interest as a model of space of something, then you get all the properties that you have by virtue of being a model of space. So this is what's happening in, in this particular instance. So let me be very precise. Let's take k and n to integers, uh, to natural numbers, k less than n. And let's consider the Grossmannian kn as a projective manifold. So that's the space of um, vector spaces CK inside of a vector space CN. And the first thing to notice is that this Grismanian, which is a projective variety of dimension um, K times N minus K, has a nice stratification, which is given by an index, which consists of two permutations, U and W, such that U is less than W in the Broa order. That just means that there is some word for W such that U appears inside when you read it in different letters. Now, what are these fellas? What are these strata? Well, my, my shortest explanation is they're projections of Richardson varieties. You can also think of them as cyclic intersections of Schubert varieties. But mostly what I'm saying is the following is take the flag variety N, so just record this N right now, and take fix, fix the standard flag and then ask for all those flags that are in, in relative position W with respect to your flag. Remember that our flags have relative position indexed by the vial group, but the vial group in the GLN case is just SN. So I can say these two flags are in W relative position with W permutation, and that means they are going to differ in certain ways in certain subspaces. So this model I in here, this open Schubert cell, that's counting those flags which are in W relative position with the standard flag. And dually, you can consider those flags that are in U standard uh, relative position with respect to a co-standard flag. You can take these two Schubert cells, intersect them, call that an open Richardson variety, 
that's something that lives inside of the flag variety, project down to the Grismanian, and then you get exactly this kind of strata. For instance, just to be very explicit, this stratification has a unique open stratum. Maybe I should say who did this. Uh, so this was Knudsen, Lam, and Spire, or at least that's that's a nice paper, the one on juggling geometry and positive varieties that explains this stratification very neatly. The unique open stratum in there, it's the following. It's just all the subspaces, so all the points in the Grismanian, such that the consecutive Plucker coordinates, the cyclic ones, are non-zero. So the top strata is just take the cyclic Plucker coordinates, make them non-zero, and, and the complement of that is exactly, sorry, make them zero, and the complement of that is exactly the top, the top stratum. So I, I tried to write down here an example very explicitly. If you take the Grismanian 2 phi, and of course this example is our running example, so that's also going to be related to the trefoil. So if I consider the moduli space of Lagrangian fillings that bound the trefoil, the answer is that moduli space is this open positroid stratum. If you take Kn equals to 5, the positroid stratum, which is top dimensional in this stratification, is given by exactly the complement of this anti-canonical class. So you take these Plucker coordinates, make them all be non-vanishing, that's your guy. In this case, U is the identity, so that's pretty simple. And W is this braid in here, which I think uh, Galatian Lam called like 2-5. Um, but anyway, it's just you move two people down and the other ones go up. This is a two Grismanian permutation. And then you end up with an underlying braid, which is this one. So that's W U inverse. And when you compute the knot associated to that, that's a trefoil knot. And it's not just a smooth trefoil knot, it's actually Legendrian. So now you can consider the moduli of Lagrangian fillings. So that's this braid variety. And this braid variety recovers exactly your positroid stratum. So this is an example how if I knew very well something about the Legendrian trefoil, which I do, then you can say things immediately about this space. In particular, it's completely obvious from this symplectic perspective that this has a cluster structure, which you know we know it to be true because we understand Grismanians very well, but um, we also know it purely in terms of floor theory in, in this particular instance. So there's the Grismanian, there's a nice stratification, and in general, those stratifications uh, come with a wealth of combinatorics. So every time you see some interesting indexing in terms of combinatorics, we were discussing UW in SN, there's a whole set of bijections, again, that goes through KLS that says, well, you can have this combinatorial description or this combinatorial description or this one or this one, and you could keep going on and on and on. Now, I don't have the time for that, but mostly the point is, what you want is for each of these combinatorial descriptions to extract a braid. So think of this as combinatorics and think of this part as topology, well, really symplectic topology. And so out of these combinatorics, can I extract a braid? For instance, out of U and W, can I draw a braid? And the answer is yes. You take W, you think of it as a braid. So you, you lift the coxeter projection and then you multiply U inverse. And, and that guy is actually a braid. But notice that two things are true. It's not necessarily a positive braid word. It was in our previous example, but in general, U inverse will be non-trivial. And so there will be negative crossings. And second, it's an N-stranded braid. So it was Grossmannian KN. This is an N-stranded braid. This braid, we are calling it the Richardson braid. This braid was considered by Galashing Lamb in the smooth setting. We're now considering it in the Legendrian setting. So that's the pigtail closure of this guy. Now, you can keep moving through the combinatorics in this direction. Let me just describe what happens when you have this fine k bounded permutation. So this is a juggler here, which has three balls. So there's the guy here, and it's going to throw three balls. Throws the first ball, throws the second ball, throws the third ball. A juggling pattern, by definition, it's telling you how strongly, how up in the air the guy is throwing this ball up, so that it lands at a given number. So you would say, well, one will land in three, and that's this guy. And you say, well, two will land in five. And then this, this ball that he caught in three, he's gonna launch it up again, and it will land in second eight. So this juggling pattern, you can show, KLS did that, that they are in bijections with these pairs UW, where W is K Grismanian and U is less than W in the Brouwer order, 
And then you can ask, OK, how out of this juggling pattern I can get a braid? And that's something uh, we've defined, and, and we call this the, the juggling braid. And what you do is you just make every crossing in here a positive crossing. So you just pretend that every crossing that you see in here is a positive crossing. And then every time that you have the guy arriving with this cusp, you just smooth it like that. So you end up in here with a braid diagram. And that defines a braid, but it has two different properties. First of all, this one is a positive word. And quite dramatically, this is a K-stranded braid word. So interestingly, you were working on the Grismanian KN. And you were able to extract two kinds of braids. An N-stranded braid, this Richardson braid, using this first set of combinatorics. And a second kind of braid, which is K-stranded braid, coming from this set of combinatorics. And now an obvious question arises, which is, are these two braids the same? And maybe more importantly, what are their braid varieties? If the two braids I can show are the same, then maybe I can argue that the braid varieties are also the same. And then you will be presenting this positroid stratum as a very different way. Because this positroid stratum maybe was expressed in terms of this braid, but now you're going to express it in terms of this K-stranded braid, now a positive word. So this presents some challenges, and I'm just mostly going to highlight the challenges. And if you want to know more, you can just ask. Um, but in the case of the Richardson, you can just write exactly the W, write exactly the U, and you realize that those negative crossings typically are not going away anywhere. So for the juggling braid, the positive braid, so you can consider its braid variety. Remember, I define braid variety for positive braid words. Now, if you do it just naively for negative braid words, again, a monkey can just randomly define it for negative braid words, but the point is it's not an invariant. So for the positive braid word, for this guy in here, that's okay. You can just consider it braid variety. But the trouble becomes this guy, which is, this is not a positive braid word, so how do I define the braid variety? And very, very, very shortly, the answer is, you don't really define a braid variety, you define something which is a braid variety endowed with a certain action of vector fields. And that's, if you wish, one of the last slides. The main thing is that we can now enhance braid varieties. That's why this is like braid varieties too. And this enhancement is heavily motivated by studying the positroid braids that we're discussing in here. So that two things happen. On the one hand, you also are allowing negative crossings. So now you can define braid varieties for braids which are having braid words which are possibly with negative crossings. So I'm allowing negative crossings as long as the braid is equivalent to a positive word, it's okay to have negative crossings. And the second thing is the Richardson braid was N-stranded, the juggling braid was K-stranded, so I need to have a way to compare braids with different number of strands, and that's mark of stabilizations. So okay, you could say, look, you define braid varieties for positive words, fine. And now, look, just think a bit harder, and you're going to find some way of defining it for negative braid words, and also where Markov stabilizations make sense. Okay, we tried. We tried pretty hard. And the answer is, almost philosophically, it cannot really be captured by one affine variety. What you can do is have an affine variety with a set of vector fields V associated to it, and then the quotient will become invariant. So the last two take home nuggets that I want you to know, and you can look at the preprint or I can send it to you if you want to know exactly how that works. There's also the next slide if you want, um, is th the following. First take home nugget is suppose you have a braid eta, that's a braid word which might have negative crossings. Then you use the positive crossings to define the braid variety as you were doing before maybe with some additional contributions from the negative crossings, but that is an affine variety. The problem is that's not invariant. It's not invariant under the Meister two moves, for instance. But the statement is that there exists a set of local linear potent derivations. So those are just vector fields which integrate to algebraic actions of, of C, just the additive group, such that the quotient is an invariant. So again, the punchline is, when you have a braid which might have negative crossings, what you should be thinking about is about affine varieties with a certain vector field in it, and then the quotient under the flow of those vector fields, that is an invariant. 
And in fact, these pairs, x eta v eta, are such that they satisfy the following property with respect to Markov. When you're dropping a top crossing in a Markov destabilization, a positive one, then you gain a C star factor. And for people who like cluster stuff, this C star factor is a frozen variable. So up to frozens, these quotients are exactly the same. But you know, you might be interested in frozens, and that's fine. So a highly non-trivial corollary of all of that is that once you've built these affine varieties and shown that there exists a way of building these local and nilpotent derivations, then you compare the affine variety of the juggling braid with the affine variety associated to the Richardson braid, model of those vector fields, and those two differ exactly by n minus k mark of destabilizations. So that corollary is non-trivial because you need to show that these two braids as Legendrians are the same. So once you've shown that, then you can compare their braid varieties because now it makes sense to talk about the left hand side and both of them are the same as a positroid. So one punchline for instance is it's clear in case for instance that u is a suborder of w that these guys are cluster. So cluster if u is a suborder of w and as a consequence you get that the positroids are also cluster and you have some explicit models um, to explain that. So how on earth am I getting this affine variety and the set of local and bottom derivations? That was the point of the next slide, explaining how the DGA works. I'm going to skip that for now, just go to the end. And if you have any questions on that, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about it. I also had some examples that maybe it's time to wrap it up and let you ask questions if you have any. Uh, so I'll leave the talk here and thanks a lot.